the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's a great joy to be here with you to talk about the true doctrine of creation and to show the errors of all the alternatives to God's revelation of what he did when he created the world. I'd like to begin by introducing myself. My name is Hugh Owen. I'm the director of the Kolbe Center for the Study of Creation, which provides a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists all over the world who defend the traditional teaching of the church on creation and show the errors of theistic evolution and other alternatives to the true doctrine of creation. Uh, this is a picture of me that was taken with my father a few years ago. My father was the son of a Baptist minister in Wales and raised in a very good Christian home. But when he went to university in England, his professors enlightened him. They told him that science could explain the origins of man and the universe without God. Evolution could explain everything in a natural way. And like millions of other people then and now, my father was robbed of his faith in Christianity and became a secular humanist. He went on to become the first charter member of the United Nations and assistant secretary general, co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. And after 25 years, he retired from the United Nations and was knighted by the Queen of England for his work with the UN. But he looked at the world and he saw that, that all the problems of the world were worse than they had been when the United Nations was started. Why was that? Well, once again, he turned to the intellectual elite and they had the answer. They said the reason why the United Nations is not making headway in solving the world's problems is it's not going to the root of all the world's problems, overpopulation. Cut down on the number of people, they said, then we'll have enough to go around and all our problems will be solved. So my father accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. My father held that job for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack when I was just 16 years old. Now I had been brought up without any prayer, without any Bible, without any church. And when my father died, I didn't want to go on living. Even though I was just 16 years old, I began to contemplate suicide day and night. And the only reason why I didn't act on this desire to kill myself was that every time I got to the point of taking my life, I had this overwhelming conviction that if I took my life, I would find myself again, and it would be forever. It would be permanent misery. And I didn't want that, so I had to go on living. And in order to distract or try to distract myself from this living hell that I was in, I concentrated as best I could on my studies, and I finished my last two years at one of the supposedly best schools in the United States in one. And I convinced my mother to give me some of the money that she saved from my tuition so that I could go with another friend of mine around the world. I don't know why she agreed to that, but she did. And so we headed out. After I had been accepted to Princeton University, I said I would take a year off before I started, and we set off to go around the world. And this is where God began to draw me to himself, because even though I was in this terrible suicidal state, I found that there was one place where I could find something like peace, and it was in the Catholic churches and also the Orthodox churches. And so one of the great experiences that I had when I was 17 was when we arrived in Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, and we stayed in a, a hostel very close to this amazing structure, the Hagia Sophia, which was built by the Emperor Justinian. And it's said that when he looked at, the, at the, this amazing cathedral, when he was finished, he said, Solomon, 
I've outdone you. And it's true, when I set foot inside of this amazing structure, I felt the presence of God. It was a really a remarkable experience. And you really have to go there someday and see it for yourself. The president of Turkey is now talking about turning it back into a mosque. I really fear for his safety if he, if he decides to do that, because God will not uh, take that lightly. And we know that one day uh, it will actually be restored to use as a Christian place of worship. But anyway, it was visiting places like this that gave me my, my first glimpse of the reality of God. But then there was something else. Um, we made it as far as Beirut in Lebanon shortly before the civil war. And uh, a man who was, uh, uh, I don't know any polite way to describe him, but he was uh, an agent for prostitutes. And I remember right in front of the hostel where I was staying, he tried to solicit me, and he, he offered me every kind of perverse uh, sexual relation that is imaginable and some that I had never even dreamed of. And every time I told him I wasn't interested, he said, I've never met a British man of your, <laughs> your mentality. But there was something that in spite of my suicidal condition, I had within me, and it was a knowledge of right and wrong. And when I was uh, depressed and my mother sent me to a psychiatrist, I never saw anybody who was paid so much money for doing so little. He would just sit there and, and listen, say nothing. But one time I told him, I said, I believe that I have broken a law that is greater than myself. I didn't learn this from my upbringing, but I had this absolute conviction that I had done wrong and I was a sinner, for lack of a better word. So I was walking in the street in Beirut, and I passed a Catholic church, and they had a sign there for confession. I said, that's what I need to do. I need to go to confession. But I didn't know anything about the Catholic faith, and I didn't, I didn't know how to, how to do this thing that I felt that I needed to do. But I realized this has something to do with Jesus Christ. And I read about all the different religions of the world, but I came to the realization that our Lord Jesus Christ was in a totally different category from all of the others. And one thing that really stood out for me was that I read about Muhammad, I read about Buddha, I read about Guru Nanak, I read about Baula, I read about all these people, but not a single one of them ever said that he was God or that he had the power to forgive sins. And so that was enough to convince me that he was very special. And so I reached the point where, in spite of this suicidal depression that I was in, I began to have a glimmer of hope. And I was sitting in a, in a park in London as uh, I returned from these travels, and a, a young girl approached me. She was probably about my age, and she asked me, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? Well, I didn't know what she was talking about, but I figured, what do I have to lose? So she led me in the sinner's prayer. I felt nothing. I thought nothing. But I experienced my whole life began to change after that point, and I knew that our Lord Jesus Christ was capable of actually forgiving my sins and taking away my guilt, something that I had never experienced in my entire life. Now, the prophet Isaiah, 750 years before the coming of Jesus, predicted that when the Messiah came, he would give sight to the blind. Now, because of Christianity spreading through the world, it doesn't really strike us as so remarkable that somebody could actually work this miracle. But do you realize that in all the thousands of years before our Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth, no one had ever given sight to the blind. And yet, Jesus did it a number of different times. And then when I came back to Princeton and I realized that Jesus had taken away my inner blindness, the next thing I wanted to do was to find out 
where I should go to church. And it so happens that the Princeton University Chapel is right in the center of the campus, and many different Christian communities were using the chapel for worship, including the Catholics. So I would go in there, and I would observe them. But I noticed that there was something different about the Catholic liturgy, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I didn't know what it was. But the other thing that this prompted me to do was to go into the reference room in the Firestone Library, which is right next to the Princeton University Chapel, and open at random the four large tomes of Butler's Lives of the Saints. And as I did this, I was amazed to find that there were men, women, and children of every background from all over the world who lived the same kind of life that Jesus did, and they all belonged to this church. So I concluded, this church must be the church that Jesus founded. And I realized that these saints, like St. Padre Pio, they lived one life with Jesus. They thought like him, they spoke like him, they acted like him, they even worked miracles like him. So just as Jesus gave sight to the blind and raised the dead, so did saints, like St. Padre Pio, even in modern times. And this struck me, but this wasn't the thing that finally drew me in once and for all. And that was when I finally realized that what was different about the, the Catholic worship from all of the others, even the Anglican Episcopal, which was very similar to the Catholic liturgy in many ways, was that God was present there in a totally different way. And I came to understand that he was present in the Holy Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity, that when our Lord Jesus Christ said at the Last Supper, this is my body, it really became his body. And when he said over the wine, this is my blood, it really became his blood. He really was present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the appearance of bread and wine. And then I realized that all through the history of the church, God had worked amazing miracles that, that proved that he was truly present. Like the miracle that he worked in Buenos Aires when the present pope was the cardinal archbishop, where a host began to bleed, and the archbishop sent this uh, bleeding host or a portion, a portion of it to a forensic lab in California, and they told them, this is human blood of the type AB, which is the same kind of blood type that is found on the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth of our Lord Jesus. And then he sent a sample to Dr. Zugibe, uh, one of the finest cardiologists in the world, without telling him, of course, what it was. And Dr. Zugibe, this world-famous cardiologist, said, this is the tissue of a living human heart in an extreme agony. And I thought to myself, where can you find <laughs> such wonders except in the church that God himself founded? And so I presented myself to the Jesuit chaplains at Princeton University and said that I would like to become a Catholic. Well, they tried to discourage me at first. They told me I should go and visit other churches and see what they were like. But I persevered, and so they finally gave me a catechism so that I could learn my Catholic faith, and that was the Dutch Catechism. But I call it the Dutch Cataclysm because this is the book that totally destroyed the faith of a once vibrant Catholic community in the Netherlands, which used to send missionaries here and there and everywhere all over the world. And the, the theme that ran through this Dutch cataclysm was that we are in a scientific age and science has enlightened us so that we can understand everything in our faith so much better than we could before. And with this nice sounding theme, the Dutch cataclysm proceeded to sow doubt in my mind and the minds of all of the readers about the literal historical truth of Genesis, creation, the existence of angels, 
the virgin birth, the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the intrinsic evil of contraception, papal infallibility, and everything in between. So it's an absolute miracle that I survived the Dutch cataclysm. Unfortunately, if you go to the Netherlands today, you'll see that the Dutch people didn't survive. There's almost nobody, no young people hardly left in the Catholic Church in Netherlands. The churches are being sold off and turned into mosques. Now, when the, when the Jesuit chaplains at Princeton University gave me the Dutch cataclysm, I accepted meekly that evolution, which was the premise behind this Dutch cataclysm, was perfectly acceptable for Catholics and that we had no, there was no reason for us not to accept it. But over the years, by the grace of God, I came to the realization that this was not the case at all. Now, I realized, for example, that when I looked in the gospel and I highlighted every place where our Lord Jesus Christ speaks about anything in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, he always speaks of them as true history. When he speaks about Adam and Eve, he speaks of them as real people who were created in a state of harmony at the beginning of creation, not 13.7 billion years after the beginning of creation. When our Lord speaks about Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, he locates him at the foundation of the world, which is a phrase in the Bible that means the beginning of creation, not just the beginning of human history. And most of all, I saw that whenever our Lord worked one of his miracles, he always acted in the same way that the church had always said that he acted in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain. For example, when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus was going on four days a decomposing corpse. A decomposing corpse has no potential to become a living anything. But when our Lord said, Lazarus, come out, in a split second, he raised Lazarus up, a breathing, living human being. And this is exactly what God had done in the beginning. Every believing Jew of that time knew that in the beginning, God took matter, which had no potential to become a living human body. He formed it into the body of the perfect man, Adam, breathed into him the breath of life, and created him, willed him into existence, a perfect man. And so this put me on the path to determine where my Jesuit priests had gone off the rails. And what we eventually discovered was that it was a long process by which most of our most highly educated people within the Catholic community had been deceived into accepting a false philosophy. And from the premises of that false philosophy, they had then embraced this evolutionary mythology in place of the true revelation from God as it had been understood in the church from the beginning. So what we are going to share with you today is the overwhelming scientific evidence that real science, as well as sound theology and sound philosophy, completely confirms the literal historical truth of the sacred history of Genesis as it was understood in the Catholic Church from the beginning. And our first natural science speaker will be Dr. Thomas Seiler. He has a PhD in physics from the Technical University in uh, Munich in Germany. He works as an engineer in Stuttgart, and he is going to present a wonderful presentation on cosmology and the Christian doctrine of creation. So if you'll just bear with us for about two minutes, we'll get him on Skype, and he will begin. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Thomas, are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, the audience is eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you. You can go ahead now. Thank you very much, Hugh, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to participate in your seminar today. Um, I'm very grateful that we can do this. I hope you hear me well. 
Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Very good. The talk which I will be giving is the about the Catholic doctrine of creation, especially of the creation of the universe, in contrast to the standard model of cosmology, the materialistic explanation for the origin of the cosmos. I will start with um, the witness the, which we have from Revelation given in the book of Genesis in Holy Scripture, which is telling us at the very first page how God created the universe. Nobody of us and no human has been eyewitness, therefore we are uh, depending on revelation in concerning how God created. But as we will see further on, it's a matter of the natural reason that we can conclude that God has created the universe supernaturally. The very first phrase in Holy Scripture is the following one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is extremely significant, and it's not by chance that this is the first sentence of the whole Bible. It tells us that when God made heaven and earth, it was in the very beginning. There was nothing which was happening before in history. In other words, the earth came at the very first moment of time. This is extremely important for understanding the, the significance of the earth our home planet. And then concerning the sun and the star, it's only on day four, as the Bible informs us, that God has created them. We read in Genesis 1, chapter 14, verse 14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a fourth day. So from here, we can already learn that there was a certain sequence in creating the celestial bodies, first earth, and then only sun and stars. This we have to keep in mind if we uh, want to evaluate interpretations of uh, modern cosmological theories in the framework of Genesis, whether they can be somehow reconciled. And then in the New Testament, we hear Jesus speak in Mark 10, but from the beginning of, of the creation, God made them male and female. Again, this tells us something about the sequence. Man was made when? From the beginning of the creation, not after billions of years of development and evolution. And in Sirah 15, he himself made man from the beginning and left him in the hand of his counselor. Now, there is one other very important in, uh, aspect in the New Testament from which we can learn something about how God created the world. It's the way how God, in the second person of the Trinity, in Jesus Christ, performed his miracles on earth. What we read there is that whenever Jesus works a miracle, he does them immediately, instantaneously, and without any help natural processes, it's supernatural. When he speaks to the blind man, see, immediately this man can see. When he says to Lazarus, who was dead already for four days, for four days, come out, immediately the body of Lazarus stood up, his soul was there, he came out. So this is the power of God, and this is how God created in the beginning. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. For he spoke, it came to be, and it stood firm. He doesn't need any help from any material force, just his word. 
in the Catholic Church, we have a great advantage that we have the, the tradition, the holy tradition, which is the other pillar of um, revelation, and especially the Church Fathers have given us with their great insight uh, the proper interpretation of Holy Scripture. And now let us listen to them, how they understood the first verses of the Bible. St. Ephraim the Syrian said in his commentary on Genesis 1, Although both the light and the cloud were created in the twinkling of an eye, still both the day and night of the first day continued for 12 hours each. Again, we have this instantaneous creation. And he continues that it is quite possible that some heavenly bodies appear to us as old, but it was just because it is just because God created them in a mature state. At the example of the moon, he says, likewise, the moon was both old and young when it was created. It was young, for it was but a moment old, but was also old, for it was as full as it is on the 15th day. And St. Ambrose, he most look forward to a late and leisurely creation of the world out of a concourse of atoms. So you hear this concourse of atoms, which was quite present among the Greek intellectual elite at that time, where St. Ambrosius, St. Ambrose wrote. This concept is very similar to what is now uh, spread everywhere. But he said, St. Ambrose said, this is not what Moses wanted to communicate in Genesis. It was not a, a very long period of creation. He continues, and fittingly, lest it be thought that there was a delay in creation. Furthermore, man would also see how incomparable the Creator was who completed such a great work in the briefest moment of his creative act, so much so that the effect of his will anticipated the perception of time. And another, our other St. Athanasius, as to the separated stars or the great lights, not this appeared first and that second, but in one day and by the same command, they were all called into being. So he refers to the fourth day of creation. And such was the original formation of the quadrupeds and of birds and fishes and cattle and plants. No one creature was made before another, but all things subsisted at once, together upon one and the same command. Of course, each category of creatures on its distinct day of creation. Let's move on to the church council. This is another authoritative source of our faith. And the uh, Vatican Council number one uh, gave a beautiful summary on the significance on the teach of the teaching of the Church Fathers. In session three, in Dogmatic Constitution concerning the Catholic faith, we read in a matter of faith and morals, no one is permitted to interpret sacred scripture contrary to the unanimous agreement of the Fathers. The same rule has been repeated by the Council of, Tra of Trent. And now, as you have heard from a few examples, we don't know of any example where a church father has ever proposed some kind of long-term creation. They all agree here unanimously that God created everything instantaneously. Therefore, it is our binding way of interpreting of interpreting Genesis. And in the 13th century, the Council of Lateran Corp issued this dogmatic decree. God, who by his own omnipotent power, at once, from the beginning of time, created each creature from nothing, spiritual and corporal, namely angelic and mundane, and finally the human. This was repeated more than 600 years later by Vatican I. And this is so important because it underlines that God created everything at once. 
from the beginning of time. Let's continue with the doctors of the church, which guide us into the truth through the centuries. And one of them is St. Bonaventure, the biographer of St. Francis of Assisi. He wrote in Previlopium, we must specifically hold that physical nature was brought into existence in six days. And the angelic doctor St. Thomas Aquinas, hence it remains that Nothing can create except God alone. There is the first cause. Therefore, in order to show that all bodies were created immediately by God, Moses said, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas is called the angelic doctor because he is considered as the doctor who had the best overview over all the church father's teachings. And he gave beautiful summaries of their teachings. So his, he, what he wrote can really be regarded as a reflection of the whole tradition of the church through the century. Now, this first phrase, it remains that nothing can create except God alone, is just the opposite of what Théa de Jardin suggested in our times. Théa de Jardin summarized his teaching in the words, God has created the creatures or the matter in such a way that matter itself can create. But St. Thomas Aquinas would reject this, of course. Now, another important uh, element of the Catholic doctrine of creation, as we read it in Summa Theologica, is the fact that the creation was completed after the seventh day of creation. Thomas writes, the final perfection which is the end of the, whole, of the whole universe, is the perfect beatitude of the saints at the consummation of the world. And the first perfection is the completeness of the universe at its first founding. And this is what is ascribed to the seventh day. In other words, creation does not continue. It does not go on even until now our time. But once this was over, a new period was active, this is the, is, they call it the, uh, the order of providence, which we live now. This is the time where the natural laws are working. And another beautiful summary of this distinction between the, the days of creation, which were totally supernatural, and the natural order is this. In the works of nature, which means today, creation does not enter. But is presupposed to the work of nature. In other words, natural processes had nothing to do with creation. Creation came first. And again, so therefore it is impossible for any creature to create, either by its own power or instrumentally, that is, ministerially, in total contrast to the doctrine of Théa de Jardin and all theistic evolutionists who maintain just this, that a creature could create. But that would put a creature on the same level with God. It would divinize nature, it would be pantheism. Let me summarize these essential elements of the Catholic doctrine of creation. First, the work of creation was purely supernatural. No material natural processes were involved in that. Second, God created the universe, the earth, plants, animals, and men, each instantaneously. And it was finished after creation week. And since then, the natural processes are at work. Uh, this beautiful doctrine has been challenged, as we know, but people know that this doctrine and its channel, the challenge against this doctrine has been predicted almost 2,000 years before. It is in the New Testament, in one of the many prophecies we read there, and this is one of the most remarkable ones, given by St. Peter, the Apostle, in his second letter. He writes, scoffers will come 
in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Now this is a very important sentence. It's St. Peter's way of formulating the philosophy of naturalism. What is naturalism tell telling us? It's telling that natural processes were at work already from the beginning of creation. And exactly this is what St. Peter predicts here. All things have continued. Natural processes have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, the universe and all the creatures came into existence by natural processes. But St. Peter rejects this when he continues. They deliberately ignore this fact that by the word of God, not by natural processes, heavens existed long ago. And an earth formed out of water and by means of water through which the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. And here is the first philosopher of modern times who fulfilled this prophecy. René Descartes, a leading theologian and philosopher in France in the 17th century, who wrote in his discourse on the method, it is an opinion commonly received by the theologians that the action by which he now preserves it, the <coughs> Sorry. It is an opinion commonly received by the theologians that the action by which he now preserves it, the world, is just the same as that by which he at first created it. So this again is the summary of the prediction of St. Peter. He just denies what we have read in the words of St. Thomas Aquinas. This distinction of the Catholic doctrine of creation between order of providence and order of creation. And he continues to say, in this way, although he had he not to begin with given the world any other form than that of chaos, provided that the laws of nature had once been established and that he had lent his aid in order that its action should be according to its want, we may well believe, without doing outrage to the miracle of creation, that by this means alone, all things which are purely material might in course of time have become such as we observe them to be at present, without God's creative act. And he says, that nature is much easier to understand when we see them coming to pass little by little in this manner, than were we to consider them all as all complete to begin with. This marks a complete departure from the Catholic tradition. At the same time, when uh, René Descartes was living in France, another genius was living in this country, Blaise Pascal. But he didn't follow this new philosophy. Instead, he commanded it in these words, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God, but he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. After that, he had no more use for God. Now, this already resembles much, this description resembles much the coming of the Big Bang theory, which many support who say that they do believe in God, but the only thing that God created was a Big Bang event, and the rest happened by itself. And this was the person who fulfilled this prediction in our times, the Belgian priest, Georges Lemaitre. He applied the new philosophy of René Descartes on the question, how did the universe come into existence? And from solving equations, he came to the idea that it is quite possible that in the past, all the stars, all the galaxies, everything we see in the universe was once very close, so close that it was packed in one single spot. 
And this spot was the beginning of the universe. This is the initial explosion. So in his words, in his published paper in Nature, 127, in the year 1931, he writes, if you go back in the course of time, we must find fewer and fewer quanta, these particles or matter, until we find all the energy of the universe packed in a few or even <coughs> in a unique quantum. He had good contacts to Pope Pius XII. And first, Pope Pius XII was somewhat open to this idea of the Big Bang cosmology because it suggested that the universe had a beginning. Of course, uh, this is a good uh, content of this theory that it has a beginning. But um, if you regard the whole of the Big Bang theory, as we will soon do, we will see there is much more contained in it that really poses problems to the Catholic doctrine. Pope Pius XII said in an address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1951, scientists agree in holding that not only the mass, but also the density, pressure, and temperature of matter must have reached absolutely enormous proportions in this initial state right after, just at the moment of a Big Bang. And then he continues, if that were true, he says, in vain would we seek an answer in natural science, which declares honestly that it finds itself face to face with an insoluble enigma. It is true that such a question would demand too much of natural science as such. In other words, Opaius has realized that it's such a big bang scenario, there is much supernatural contained. We really transgress the laws, the borders of physics there. But even that was too much for Lemaitre. He, he didn't want that even at the beginning we speak of supernatural processes. As science writer Simon Singh of the BBC writes in Big Bang, Lemaitre contacted Daniel O'Connell, director of the Vatican Observatory and the Pope's science advisor, and suggested that together they try to persuade the Pope to keep quiet on cosmology. The Pope was surprisingly compliant and agreed with the request. The Big Bang would no longer be a matter suitable for papal addresses. Now let us examine the scientific arguments for such a Big Bang scenario. Usually the first argument given in favor of it is the so-called redshift of starlight. What is that? You probably have heard about the so-called Doppler effect. At least you are familiar with it. For example, when you hear an ambulance with the horn coming closer to you, with a melodic sound, you will hear that the sound appears at a higher frequency to your ears than when the ambulance is receding from you. This is because the wavelengths are shifted and therefore the frequencies which reach you are shifted because of the state of motion of the source of this uh, uh, sound. And the same applies to light. If a light source image in the image here, the upper line, is moving away from us, then the emitted light appears at a higher wavelength. And this has the appearance of a reddish color, like red. However, if the light source approaches us, then the waves, the light waves, are compressed in a way, and this is corresponding to a shift of the frequency towards the color of blue. So shift to red and to blue seems to tell us something about the state of motion of the light source. How can we measure the frequency distribution of light? It's very simple. All you need is a prism in principle. This prism is a, a triangle 
filled with a triangle out of glass, a volume of glass, through which a light beam is sent and different light waves, light frequencies, which are usually contained in a white light, are all bent in a different angle when they pass into the medium. And this splits the frequencies, so when you leave this light then onto a screen, you can see the rainbow colors telling you which frequencies were present in the original white light beam. This is such an image graph of a laboratory experiment where a light beam has been sent through a prism. Now, um, the same thing contains another information, not only the light frequencies, but it can contain very distinct so-called absorption lines. When you have a light source and you lead the light beam through a gas, then some, part, some frequencies are in resonance with the atoms of this gas, and they will be missing the, uh, in the diagram which we receive with the light frequency distribution. But important that these frequencies, these po the positions where we see these characteristic lines, they are always at the same position, at the same frequency. So they are like a fingerprint. We can repeat this in the laboratory wherever we are in the world. When you have a certain element, a certain gas, you will get certain patterns here. Now, this can be applied to starlight, and it has been done extensively. And to the great surprise of many, it was found that these characteristic absorption lines of the whole spectrum is always, or almost always, in most cases, shifted towards the red spectrum, red towards lower frequency, towards higher wavelength, longer wavelength. So, if that's the case, that all starlight, wherever we look, is shifted toward the spectrum red, toward the color red, in accordance with what we have just heard about what a redshift means, this can be interpreted in terms of stars and galaxies moving away from the observer, from us. And if that's the case, that the galaxies are moving away today from us, then yesterday they must have been closer to each other and to us, and still earlier in time, still closer and closer and closer, until all the matter is compressed in one so-called singularity. And this was the moment of the Big Bang. It seems to be a, quite a good support for the theory of George Lemaitre, and um, this led to the standard model of cosmology. This is a picture published by NASA, and it summarizes the standard concept, which is taught in every university. From left to right, it wants to tell the history of the universe. It started with nothing, and nothing exploded in this idea. And they call this nothing explodes a quantum fluctuation. This was followed by a very rapid expansion phase, so-called inflation. We'll come back to this later. Faster than the speed of light, the universe expanded very rapidly according to this. And then, after 80,000 years, um, the, there were the so-called dark ages. It was a time when light could not travel. Only after 400 million years, it had cooled down so much, the universe, that the electrons, which hindered the light from traveling, were captured by the nuclei of the atoms. And that also made the first stars come into existence when more and more heavy elements were created or came together and were produced. Then, in the next billions of years, these stars arranged in galaxies and also produced planets. And finally, after some nine billion years, 
our planet Earth came into existence. And important, this acceleration, this expansion is still continuing and even at an accelerated rate. Now you can already see that this concept is hard to reconcile with the report of Genesis, even if you interpret the Genesis days in a figurative way, saying that each creation day would represent a long period of time. Because, as you see, the Earth comes just at a very late moment in this whole scenario, only after some nine billion years. Now, with this standard model, it's actually very easy to calculate the age of the world, or at least this is what is suggested to us, that we can do this. These 13.7 billion years, how do we arrive at this number? It's done like this. If you take any star or see, which you see in the universe and you measure its redshift, then from the redshift you deduce its velocity by the simple law of the Doppler effect or the Hubble constant. Now you measure the brightness. And from the brightness, people conclude how far the star is away from us. It's again a very simple calculation. The fainter a star is, the farther away it is. Simply because the light which reaches us here in the center is thinned out, and therefore you see it uh, at a farther, it's at a farther distance. That's why it's more faint. It can be very can be calculated very easily. Now with these two things. You know the velocity apparently and the distance, you apply the law of linear motion, which is also used for the mo motion of cars, bicycles, of airplanes. Why not use it for the universe? And if you do this, you can calculate the time which it took the star to travel from here to the edge of the universe. And you have most theorists also apply a certain co gravity correction factor of two thirds, but this is not very significant. It's important that the main feature is you divide distance by velocity, brightness by redshift, and then you get to this famous 13.7 billion years. But is this really convincing that this is the age of the world? Is this a proof? There are assumptions in it which are not proven, and usually this is not admitted. For example, one is such an unproven extrapolation as this, that a star, if it moved, always had the same movement since the beginning of creation. Here again, we encounter the principle of uniformitarianism, is, if you wish, or what St. Peter predicted, in his letter, all things have been the same from the beginning of creation. This age calculation method is just applying this principle predicted 2000 years ago. But it's not honest because it does not admit what is obvious that any movement which we observe today could have been different yesterday. We simply haven't measured it yesterday, so we can't say how it was all the time. This very simple equation just hides that we don't know this. Furthermore, we will see soon that there is good reason to doubt that redshifts can really be taken as a measure for velocity, for brightness, for distance. There can also be other factors which influence redshift and brightness of stars besides velocity and distance. Now let us come to the second pillar of evidence for the Big Bang Theory, the cosmic microwave background radiation. When we look into the starlight, star night, we see that most of the space is black with our own eyes. It's dark. Nothing seems to, to be shining there. But if we regard the universe with modern instruments that can measure microwaves, and we see that there is a radiation wherever we look, even where there are no stars. And interestingly, 
Uh, this cosmic microwave background radiation has been predicted before it was discovered. This is a very strong argument in favor of a theory. The Big Bang theory had, based on the works of Alpha and Hermann, led to the prediction of a background radiation temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. No, sorry, of 5 Kelvin in the year 1948. And it was discovered in 1964, so almost 20 years later, the measured temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. This sounds very close to the predicted value and was celebrated by many as the final proof for the truth of the Big Bang Theory. Let us now, next few slides, examine the arguments for the Big Bang. First, we treat the uh, cosmic microwave background. Is it really a proof? Here we have to say that the microwave background can not only be explained by a Big Bang model, but by other models even such models which don't have anything to do with cosmology, which have anything to do with the model or the origin of the universe. In this diagram, you see the temperature of the microwave background on the y-axis. The Big Bang predicted in 1948 5 Kelvin. So, just for those who are not familiar with this unit, the temperature of Kelvin goes from zero, which is the absolute uh, zero, where no, no movement at all happens, you can't get colder, and its value of 273 Kelvin corresponds to our zero in Celsius. Uh, I don't know what's it in Fahrenheit, but this is where water freezes. Water freezes at 273 Kelvin. So you see 5 Kelvin is uh, minus 268 degree Celsius. Extremely cold, but still measurable. But 22 years before the prediction of Alpha and Hermann, there was another prediction by Eric Regener, who took the energy of the cosmic particles as a basis for his calculations. And from that, he concluded that there must be a cosmic microwave background radiation. And his prediction was 2.8 Kelvin. And another one, Sir Arthur Eddington. He calculated in the same year, based on the star radiation energy, that there should be a cosmic microwave background radiation value, which should be 3.2 Kelvin. Another one in 1964, still before the discovery, was by Fred Hoyle. He took the observed helium in, in the cosmos and interpreted it as a product of nuclear fusion of hydrogen. From that, he derived how much energy should have been released in these processes, leading to a cosmic microwave background of 2.78 Kelvin. And as you heard before, what was measured in 1965 was 2.73 Kelvin. So of these four calculations, the Big Bang prediction is the worst. The other ones are much better. Therefore, it's true what Jean-Marc bonnet bidot admitted in his book La Lumière diffuse de l'univers in Un autre cosmos, another cosmos, published in 2012, Due to the lack of these basic confirmations, the cosmological character of the background radiation, which means that it comes from the Big Bang origin of the universe, cannot be considered as proven today. Because of its very weak energy, it can be produced by a very large range of physical processes. So this teaches us a very important lesson. When we find some kind of evidence for a theory, we always have to ask ourselves, is it very unlikely that there are also other processes that could lead to this kind of observation? 
and we can't just pick out one single interpretation. Then another feature of uh, astronomy, which sheds doubt on the way how the Big Bang is based on, loss, on, on redshifts and uh, faintnesses of starlights. This image here shows the Hubble constant. It's published by the Harvard University. The reported values of the Hubble constant from the 1920s until today. The Hubble constant, named after Edwin Hubble, who had observed very many of such redshifts, he was a pioneer in this regard. It's the quotient of velocity of a star or a galaxy divided by its distance. So this quotient is just the opposite of distance by velocity. If you remember, distance by velocity was just the age of the universe with this correction factor of two-thirds. Here you see the history of what has been reported to us. In the early, the first half of the 20th century, we were informed that the Hubble constant amounts to around 500 km per second per megaparsec. Then, in the 50s, we were told that these measurements were wrong. The redshifts and the, the faintnesses which led to these results, these explosions, were interpreted in a wrong way. Other physical processes caused either the redshifts or the the faintnesses to a large degree. So one had to correct to 300 km per second per megaparsec. And this has gone down in the, until the 70s to around 70 km per second per megaparsec. This translates in ages from 2 billion years, which were the accepted age of the universe in the 1930s, down to 14 billion years. In other words, today the astronomers admit that we have been informed wrongly by 12 billion years in the time when the Big Bang Theory has been developed. 12 billion years off. Now, even if we look in today's measurements, so this is the same image here, just to zoom in into the last decades, decades, um, then we see that even today, although the average value somehow is around 70 meter per second per megaparsec, the scatter is enormous. Different research groups, different astronomers report totally different values for the Hubble constant, which lead to different ages ranging from 10 billion years to a universe as old as 30 billion years. So this clearly proves that something in the redshift cannot be due to movement, or, and something in the faintnesses of the stars, as we observe it, cannot be due to distance. In other words, even if we admit that the stars were receding from us, and we can measure the distance, and, and, and the Hubble constant is true, the movement was always the same, we still have to conclude that we cannot really measure the redshift and the distance by faintness. So I cannot measure the movement and the distance by redshift and faintness in a reliable way. There's some systematic problem with this kind of measurement. And therefore, it's meaningless to say the universe has an age of 13.7 billion years. Let's move on with Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble published a book in the 1930s called The Realm of the Nebulae. And there he underlines that we must be careful when we want to interpret the redshift as an evidence for movement. It could also have other uh, causes. He writes, careful examination of possible sources of uncertainties suggests that the observations can probably be accounted for if redshifts are not velocity shifts. If redshifts are velocity shifts, then some vital factors must have been neglected 
in the investigation. <coughs> and he gives one possibility to interpret the redshift in an alternative way. He says, light may lose energy during its journey through space. But if so, we do not yet know how the loss can be explained. Light losing energy is equivalent to light obtaining a lower frequency or higher wavelength, which is a redshift. And again, in the observational approach to cosmology, on the other hand, if the recession factor is dropped, if redshifts are not primarily velocity shifts, the picture is simple and plausible. So, let us now, after we have now seen that these two alleged proofs for the Big Bang, the redshift and the cosmic microwave background are not proofs. Let us move to observations which directly contradict the Big Bang model. The first and most important one is that the cosmos, and especially our Earth, is the order. The Big Bang starts with explosion. But what we see here in our surroundings is an ideal place to live. There are so many parameters which could be different and then life would be impossible. For example, we have the ideal distance to the, to the sun. If you were a little bit closer only, everything would melt. There wouldn't be any water. Everything would evaporate. If we were too far, a little bit further away, everything would freeze. You, you know certainly that there is a very intense discussion on climate change going on, where tiny amounts of carbon dioxide could, according to calculations which are presented, um, change the climate drastically. Uh, how much more would this be the case if the carbon dioxide changed by a huge factor? Or oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, all these elements which are so essential for life weren't there in the right amount. We have liquid water, we have moderate seasons, we have the absence of heavy earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, radioactivity, poisonous chemicals, and so on and so on. Things which are all present on the other planets. Earth is very fine-tuned. And we could continue with the fine-tuning of the natural laws, of the natural constants. Now, if that all started from an explosion, which is a maximum of disorder, it would be impossible to create an ordered object like this one. Why? That? Because the most fundamental law of nature, it's called the second law of thermodynamics, it excludes any natural processes from creating order from disorder. And familiarize yourself with all chemical and physical reactions that are going on around you. Now, um, that this is the case, is now admitted by very many astronomers, like, for example, Professor Bernard Carr. In an interview in the movie The Principle, he comments on the fine-tunings. The fine-tunings. If we are the only universe, the fine-tunings are really hard to explain. And then he offers a way how he could apparently escape from this unexplainable reality. He says, on the other hand, if you have a multiverse, then it's fairly natural by a simple selection effect that we are going to be in one of the universes which is going to allow life to rise. And he continues, if there is only one universe, you might have to have a fine tuner. If you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. What is a multiverse? Today, astronomers, they say that all these fine-tunings in the universe can only be explained by the fact that there are infinitely many universes with infinitely many Big Bangs. They have produced all kinds of cosmic constellations with all kinds of natural laws. And of course, if it's really infinitely many of them, then it's natural that there is one which created me and you, at least our bodies, and the entire Earth and everything. It's just chance. So, of course, this is totally unscientific. And 
what's even more important it omits the important question where did all the multiverses come from so this is even more mysterious then we simply can't escape from the conclusion that there must be a fine tuner there must be a god who created the universe and all the order which see which we see therein and furthermore even if you had infinitely many distributions of matter in all different constellations, this would still not create a conscious mind, a soul. It's a totally different reality, so it wouldn't save the philosophy from against the reality. Now let us continue with the, another uh, great difficulty of the Big Bang Theory. It concerns the theory of star formation. The standard star formation theory goes like this. After the Big Bang, when matter cooled down, the first atoms formed, these formed gases from nebulae, and by their own gravity, nebulae somehow contracted. And they contracted to such a dense state, to such a small volume, that they at one point became very hot and ignited. And this is how stars form. This theory is very widespread. However, seldom is it mentioned that there is a fundamental natural law which prohibits such a scenario. And it's the simple gas pressure law. Gas pressure is the counter movement against such a gravity movement because the gas naturally always tends to increase its volume and not to be pulled together. This pressure is much stronger than the gravitational attraction between the atoms. For example, when you take such an aerosol and you press it, the gas will always move from the spot of high pressure to the place of low pressure. It will never move vice versa. The gravity is just not enough. Even if you are at very cold temperatures, it can't work. Now, with such a dilemma, different solutions have been proposed. One of them is that to create a star, there was a supernova explosion in the vicinity of a gas cloud to reduce the pressure wave. And this pressure wave compressed the gas until it was dense enough to form a first star. Another theory says in the vicinity of a gas nebula, there were cold particles flying around which entered into the nebula and they decreased the temperature very rapidly, causing a contraction which led to the desired dense star formation state. And C, there were two galaxies which came too close to each other, they were colliding, and by this caused a very strong compression of everything which was in between them, and in that way gases were compressed to form stars. Now let us quickly examine these three solutions. First, that the supernova explosion would produce a pressure wave. A supernova is an exploding pre-existing star. So this can never explain how the first star came into existence. Second, what about the injected particles? Brains and particles, according to the Big Bang Theory, must have been produced in a pre-existing star. And finally, colliding galaxies causing compression. Well, galaxies are just consisting of many pre-existing stars. So none of these solutions can overcome the principal, principal problem which we have here. As Eva Novotny admits in her textbook, Introduction to Stellar Atmospheres and Interiors, the process by which an interstellar cloud is concentrated until it is held together gravitationally to become a protostar is not known. There is no natural explanation for how stars could have formed. It's an amazing statement for many people. And Martin Harvard, in a book review in Science in 1986, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is 
that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. Carl Sada and Frank Schu, Science in 1990, the origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems in contemporary astrophysics. <clears throat> you see, this is one of the most basic tasks of cosmological theory, and the theory of the Big Bang still can't solve this. Come, let's come to another observation. The cosmic fossil record, if you want to call it like this. If the Big Bang theory were true, then we here in the middle of being the observers, if we look to a star which was at the end of the visible universe, then its life would have taken 13.7 billion years to reach our eyes. Now, in such a scenario, what we would see today is only the tip of this light beam, which means it's the part of the light which has been sent out 13 billion years ago. <clears throat> In other words, what we see is very old light. We see the past. You watch when the star was young. So distant stars deliver old light, show us something about the young state of the universe, if the Big Bang were true. Nearby stars, however, they also have emitted their light 13.7 billion years ago, but much, most of its light has already passed by. What we see today is the more recent part, the tail of this light beam. So near stars, they, they are observed as young light. Therefore, they show us the st state of the star in which was more recent, where it was already very mature, where it was already, already very old. Okay, let's do an examination with our most sensitive telescopes, where we can watch very deep space regions and compare them to the near space regions. The results were very unexpected. It was found that galaxies in very distant in young regions looked just like those in the old regions, in the nearby regions. Furthermore, there was no unambiguous observation of galaxy formation anywhere. In other words, there is no cosmic evolution. It should be visible. That's why Marcus John writes in New Scientist in 2005, but there's a problem. We don't see young galaxies, says Lerner. We see old ones. They have pretty much the same range of stars as present-day galaxies. And Richard Ellis from the California Institute of Technology, the real puzzle is that these galaxies seem to be already quite old, and the universe was only about 5% its current age. So here we encounter something which is very very similar to what we see in the geological column, in the geological fossil record. No evolution. Whatever appears is already mature, is fully formed, totally in contradiction to the prediction of the theory. The next problem. There are very unexpected star movements. Many galaxies can be observed as spiral galaxies which are rotating. And it is always and always found that the rotation velocity is way too fast for being long-term stable. If they rotated with the speed which we observe today for billions of years, all the stars would have already fallen apart, would not have been held together like that. So, how do astronomers or cosmologists try to explain that? This is a very strong evidence for a young universe, a universe much younger than the Big Bang time scale. They propose as a solution that around these galaxies is a halo of dark matter. Nobody knows what dark matter is, but it is postulated in order to provide the gravity 
to keep the spiral rotation formation stable long enough. Otherwise, we would have to discard the area of the thing. Another uh, pattern of the universe, as mentioned, according to the standard model, to more recent observations from a redshift of, of supernovas, one had to conclude that if the universe is expanding, if the redshift comes from a recession, then today it's proceeding with an accelerated expansion. Now, this is very uh, improbable for an explosion. If something explodes, you would expect that initially it has the highest speed and then it becomes slower. But we would have to conclude now is that the stars and galaxies are moving away ever faster and faster. The big problem is what could power such a move? And the answer is there is dark energy. Instead of admitting that this is a contradiction to the Big Bang Theory, postulated there is some unknown form of energy. And then um, we have an unexpected radiation pattern in the microwave background. First, it is found that the microwave background is extremely homogeneous. The temperature fluctuations were measured to be only a 30 millionth of a Kelvin. This led to many theoretical problems with the calculations, because if the microwave background was created at the very beginning, just right after the Big Bang, it shows that um, the temperature of the universe was already very early, very even. But um, at the time when radiation could travel from one side to the other side to produce this equilibrium, the universe, according to Big Bang calculations, was already too big for equilibration. Radiation could not travel from one side of the other to the other of the universe. So what is proposed? Um, the thermal equilibrium was already reached directly after the Big Bang. But, but there's a new problem. If that had happened, then the universe would have contracted again. It would not never have become as big as today. How can we solve this? We have to introduce an ultra-fast expansion by an unknown inflation process to overcome this gravitational attraction, which would have led to the collapse of the universe. <coughs> now, see, um, uh, this is another physical quantity just introduced to save the Big Bang model. But again, this leads to a problem. The galaxies which we observe today are distributed into two homogeneous, inhomogeneous if the microwave background really shows the past. Another proposed solution, there must be another kind of dark matter which provides the gravity to cluster the galaxies. This led to a new theoretical problem. The expansion would then be too weak. The age could only be 8 billion years. Let's try to fit another piece of puzzle into this. The solution would be there is dark energy to increase the expansion rate, so we measure 13.7 billion years. I continue. Another observation is the density of matter, which is in a disagreement with the uh, predictions of the Big Bang Theory. When we calculate the density of matter as derived from the observed distribution of deuterium helium lithium abundances, it's 20 times lower than what is predicted by the Big Bang. Where is all this missing mass? It's, according to theorists, unknown, non-baryonic, dark matter. What is non-baryonic? Bary baryonic is matter which we have in our physical world, in, in the chemical world. It's that which is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. We don't know of any non-baryonic world, but here it's introduced as being a huge part of the universe. So all these phenomena which I've mentioned sum up to a distribution composition of the universe as shown in this diagram published by NASA. This diagram says that if we want to explain the existence, the origin of the universe by a Big Bang scenario, then we have to conclude 
that only 4.6% of the universe is composed of atoms. And the rest must be composed, 96.5% must be composed of dark energy and dark matter to explain the origin of 5%. So what have we gained by this theory? We have introduced 20 times more than we had in the beginning to explain. 20 times ununderstood entities that we started with. So we are less wise than before. This was too much to many astronomers. And 33 of them published an open letter in New Scientist called Bucking the Big Bang. In that, in 2004, they wrote, the Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Inflation, dark matter, and dark energy are the most prominent examples. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by strong and bang theory in the field of physics. With this continual recourse to new hypothetical objects, he accepted as a way of bridging the gap between theory and observation. It would, at the least, raise serious questions about the validity of the underlying theory. So let me summarize the cosmological standard model. First, the bank cosmology is unproven. The microwave temperature can be explained by various different processes which have nothing to do with cosmology. Much or even all of the redshift brightness measurements is certainly not due to velocity and distance. And several astronomical observations contradict the Big Bang theory. The homogeneity of the microwave background, apparent accelerated expansion of the cosmos, the stability of spiral galaxies, low density of matter, and in order to maintain the Big Bang theory, 95% of the universe would be scientifically unknown. And furthermore, there's no observation of evolution in the cosmic history if you look into deep space regions. Star formation cannot be explained by natural processes. And most important, cosmic order formation cannot be explained by natural processes. It can never come from a chaos of a Big Bang to the order which we observe today. In other words, Big Bang theory is not only unscientific, not only unproven, it is contradicted by natural law. It is therefore true that the European Southern Observatory wrote in spaceflight in 2004, this and many other recent astronomical observations point increasingly to the conclusion that a mature, active, evolving and expanding universe could have come into being in an instant creation. You see how close this is to the Catholic doctrine of creation? It's, by the way, similarly close as this sentence here, um, in order to maintain the Big Bang Theory, 95% of the universe would be scientifically unknown. It's the same as the Catholic doctrine says. We cannot explain the origin of what we see by known natural processes. It's amazing how modern science arrived at the same conclusion. Now, why is the Big Bang Theory incompatible with the Catholic faith? Let me summarize these points. First, scientific counter-arguments cannot be ignored. Many people say, um, I have no problems with, with believing in God, with being a Catholic, and believing in the Big Bang Theory. But as Catholics, we are bound to the honesty to recognize these scientific counter-arguments. Second, the billions of years which are essential for the Big Bang Theory directly contradict Holy Scripture and the Church Fathers, Doctors and Councils of the Church throughout the history of the Church through our tradition, which is one, the second important source of revelation given by the Holy Spirit as Holy Scripture. And only God, but no natural process, can create order. 
if the Big Bang theory were true, even if God created an initial Big Bang, natural processes, nature, matter, would be divinized. This is pantheism. And finally, Genesis reveals that the earth and plants were created before the sun and the stars. This is extremely significant and completely breaks with the uh, possibility having a figurative interpretation of the Genesis days as representing billions of years, each of them, who just would not work with this sequence. Now, why did God create the earth first and then the other heavenly bodies? The answer is that this way is telling us that the earth, and therefore we, are significant. It's not that we are just some meaningless spot in an endless universe and everything is much more significant than the Earth is. No, it's the other way around. And that the universe has been created for us and not we for the universe or not by the universe. Now I want to give you one important evidence for this coming from modern science. It's coming from the redshift. Even Hawking wrote in a brief history of time about one of the most uh, of the nearest conclusions that we should make when we see the redshift. As I told, the redshift looks the same wherever we look in, in the sky, and this has severe consequences if we think it to the end. Hawking writes, at that time, most people expected the galaxies to be moving around quite randomly and so expected to find as many blue shifted spectra. It was quite a surprise, therefore, to find that most galaxies appeared red shifted. Now, at first sight, evident looks the same. Whichever direction we look is red shifted, might seem to suggest there is something special about our place in the universe. In particular, it might seem that if we observe all other galaxies to be moving away from us, then we must be at the center of the universe. Or Edwin Hubble realized this it was an inevitable conclusion of his own work. To avoid this, and he had an idea, which is the basis for the standard model, he formulated it in this way. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous, in a sense, to the ancient conception of a central Earth. The hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it is unwelcome and would be accepted only as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. The unwelcome supposition of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. He says we are not allowed to draw this very obvious conclusion, but he doesn't say why he wants us to be in the center of the universe. He doesn't want to be the Earth significant. And in order to arrive at this philosophic conclusion, he introduced this concept of how the cosmos works. He says, yes, it's true, we see that everything is redshifted in all directions, but if you interpret this as a movement, then it's only a movement which is everywhere the same. It's not that we are the center of this expansion, but every point of space is such a center of expansion. Therefore, you would see the same redshift distribution wherever you are in the universe. In other words, if you put all the galaxies on the surface of a balloon and you blow it up, what you would see is that each galaxy is receding from its neighbors. And if you measured the redshift from any of them, you would see the same pattern from all spots. And that in three dimension would be how the cosmos behaves. Every point in space. So here, where I am sitting now here in Germany would be in the center of expansion. 
but also where you are in the US would also be the center of expansion everywhere. And why? Just to say the cosmological principle that no place can, is allowed to be significant, especially not the Earth, purely philosophical uh, basis. This is just another representation of the model. In the left, you see uh, where the Earth and the galaxies are at one moment of time, and later everything would be farther away from each other. But there's no proof of that. Hubble says, all observers, regardless of their location, will see the same general picture of the universe. If we see the nebulae all receding from our position in space, then every other observer, no matter where he may be located, will see the nebulae, galaxies, all receding from his position. However, however the assumption is adopted. There must, there must be no favored location in the universe. No center, no boundary. All must see the universe alike. Of course, we can ask, who is the authority who speaks out this must? It's not one to whom we are bound to obey. But physicist Paul Davis uh, said that this is not the only possible way of inter interpreting the homogeneous distribution of the redshifts. In Nature, he writes in 1978, it has always been realized, however, that a redshift of light can have another cause, gravity. As we see only redshifts, whichever direction we look in the sky, the only way in which this could be consistent with a gravitational explanation is if the Earth is situated at the center of an inhomogeneous universe. Let me conclude with a proof of history that God can and does move celestial bodies by his word only, very rapidly. This is an image of a secular newspaper of Portugal from the 13th of October 1917. It shows the Covada area in Fatima. 70,000 people saw that God is indeed more powerful than the heavenly bodies. They saw the sun leaving its ordinary movement, and they bent down and realized that there is someone who is more powerful than they are. This miracle had been predicted. Many came who were doubtful atheists, skeptics, they wanted to ridiculize the whole prediction, but they were convinced that this is all true. They saw what is described here by T. Marto in these words. We could look at the sun with ease. It did not bother at all. It seemed to be fading and glowing in one fashion, then another. It threw shafts of light one way, another, painting everything in different colors. The people, the trees, the earth, even the air. At a certain point, the sun stopped its play of light and then started dancing. It stopped once more and again started dancing until it seemed to loosen itself from the skies and fall upon the people. Now, if God did this just about 100 years ago, just by his word, Certainly, he can have done this at the beginning of creation, and this is what he did. Therefore, let me finally summarize our examination and the result of it by St. Isaac the Syrian, who was a hermit and a bishop in the first millennium. He wrote about how God created everything. Oh, Solely by his good will, not by any natural process, suddenly, not of billions of years, brought everything, not just few atoms in a big bang, from non being into being. And everything stood before him in perfection. The universe was perfect and it was harmonious. Not only uh, was it working in a harmonious way, also, among the first humans was 
perfect love and harmony and with the creatures. And what destroyed everything was human sin. And when you look at this icon of St. Isaac and the paper which he held in his hand, it says, it has been given to you for repentance. After all what you have seen now, you must acknowledge the power of God. And you must acknowledge that we have to repent, we have to follow his law which he has written into our hearts. And he carries the cross, the cross of Jesus, paid for our sins to restore the original harmony cosmos and between us and God and between us and our neighbors by paying for our debt on the cross with his blood. And if we do repent and if we receive the forgiveness from Christ, then we can agree with the psalmist and sing with him these words. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man, that you are mindful of him, and the son of man, that you care for him, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank you for your attention.